There's a habit that each and every one of us does, I think, daily. It's a habit that if you're aware of your own mind and your own heart, the way that we construct reality, the way that we live our days, the way that we wake up, the way that we go to bed, the way that we interact with one another, you'll notice a subtle habit that we have that God seems to have too, at least in the Torah. I haven't met God in that way, or maybe I have, but it seems to be a habit that the Torah speaks to that's pretty good advice for us. And after all, what exactly is the Torah except a really, really good series of advice on how to live a better life, Jewishly speaking? So the habit is basically this. Most of us, if not all of us, think that the way to improve our lives, the way to improve our relationships, the way to improve our jobs, the way to improve our happiness is to focus on what's not working and fix it. We are, at least evolutionarily speaking, to some degree, predisposed to noticing lack, to noticing what's missing. Those who are in the field of architecture can speak to this, artists among us can speak to the way that the mind and the brain maps missing pieces and kind of fills in what's missing. We're drawn to lack. We're drawn to pain. We're drawn to what irks us and what, what seems to not be going well. And there's something very profoundly important about that. Don't get me wrong. The air conditioning here probably is making all of us feel a bit more comfortable than were it not on. And that was a pretty ingenious invention, even if we can talk about whether or not it's ruining the planet. But you get my drift. There are things that we need to fix and focus on what's lacking in order to fix it. But two brothers, the Heath brothers, in a book called Switch, argue that really change happens not when we notice what's going wrong, but when we bring our attention to what's going right and notice the conditions around that appearance of right and replicate it. In the Torah portion, I alluded to God has a habit, so the Torah portion tomorrow morning will be the beginning of the book of Genesis, the beginning of the Torah. And one of the most remarkable things is that the Torah doesn't begin with goodness. It begins with choshech, with darkness. The first verse of the Torah says, Bereshit bar Elohim et hashem et in the beginning of God's creation, heaven and earth. Ve'aretz ha'ita tov avo ve'choshech of b'nei tohom, second verse. And the earth was unformed, it was chaotic, it was dark. Things were pretty bad. This is where Leonard Korn, of course, gets his, you want it darker. It's pretty dark in the beginning. According to the rabbinic tradition, the Torah is playing off of creation myths that are extant in the ancient Near East, but the Torah begins with chaos. Creation begins with darkness. And here, of course, darkness, we're not going to get into a philosophical conversation about dark and the moral valence of dark, but here in the Torah it means very clearly, as the next verse will tell us, that something that needed fixing. And so God creates light. And God says, let there be light. And there was light. And then God does something really amazing. And God saw that the light. And God said, woof, that's good. And lest we think that it's a moment of vanity, God's saying, wow, look at that. Did you see what I just did there? Look at that. Look at me. I'm omnipotent. That's the way it works. I can just do what I want. <laughs> Look at that. You're welcome. Ba -ba 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 -ba. There you go. Here's your, you know. I'm a demigod. I'm a god. There's the light. No, the Torah says, Vayarli was the And God said it was good. In each and every moment of the creation story in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis, God will say it was good. And in the writings of the, grand, the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, Rav Nachman of Breslev, this is called finding the Nikuda Tovak, finding the good point. And saying, oh, that's good. You know who's got this down? Ted Lasso. <laughs> and it bothers everybody. He says, like in one of the first episodes, he says, you know, my wife wants, I, you know, we, our marriage might not last. My optimism <laughs> is getting in the way. I keep finding the Nikuda Tovak, I keep finding these good points. 
And maybe it's Pollyannish, or maybe it begins to wear on you. You say, oh, wow, what a, what a tzaddik, what a righteous person. He's always finding these good points. But according to those brothers I mentioned, the Heath brothers, th this is the work that they've done in short-term therapeutic intervention is to find the storyline where something is anomalous because it's good. In every situation, they have a number of examples, but one of them was there was a child who was, you know, was impossible child. He was being thrown into every foster care. And each and every situation, the child was being told over and over again that the child was disruptive and aggressive. And until finally, the Heath brothers quote this study where a particular person who had this Ted Lassoism, this kind of God, it's a good point. This optimistic look, this ability to find the hidden thing. He arrives on the scene and he begins to track this kid whose name is Bobby in all of his classes. And there's one class amongst all the classes where Bobby's doing well. Or better, not well, but better than in the other classes. And so this, this researcher that the Heats quote, his name was John Murphy. Murphy came in and he asked this child about that class that was better than the other classes, where he was performing slightly better. And so this kid, Bobby, said to this researcher, John Murphy, he said, in Mrs. Smith's class, you, something's going on. Can you tell me anything about Mrs. Smith's class? And Bobby said, you know, um, not really. I don't know, he writes. He said, she's nicer. We get along great. So the researcher said in his Ted Lasso, God finding the spark, what the researchers call the bright spot, finding the bright spot, the nikudatova, that little point. These researcher, John Murphy, says to him, he wasn't content with this vague conclusion that this Mrs. Smith was nicer. And he kept probing until Bobby identified several things about the class that seemed to help him behave well. For instance, Miss Smith always greeted him as soon as he walked into the class, and the other teachers understandably avoided him. She gave him easier work, which she knew he could complete because Bobby had a learning disability. And whenever the class started working on an assignment, she checked with Bobby to make sure he understood the instructions. Mrs. Smith's class was a bright spot. It was at Nikudatova. It was tov. It was good. And so John Murphy, the researcher, started to try to replicate those conditions. He said, what would it be like if those things that happened in Mrs. Smith's class would happen in other classes? Instead of focusing on why he doesn't behave well in those other classes and doing archaeology, figuring out maybe it was something in his past, he said, let's replicate the things that are going well, what they call finding the bright spot and repeat it. Find the bright spot. Man, I love that. I love it. It's not easy, right? Oh, man, it's not easy. The letter, the ninth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is a tet. Its shape is kind of like a big bowl with one piece sticking in, really this piece like this. That's what it's shaped like. And the first time it appears in the entire Torah is on the word good, tov, good. And the mystics say, you see, the letter itself tells you the story about what good is. It's hidden. You have to look for it. Like that little piece that is pointing inside. Find the bright spot. Repeat it. Find the bright spot. Repeat it. Elohim And God said out loud, you know, I also had that problem. I started with darkness. But then I made some light and I named it. And then I repeated it and I repeated it in the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day. It was good, it was good, it was good. Until finally we get to the sixth day where God creates human beings. And you think, wow, God's going to say it's good and God doesn't say it's good. And now we know why. Who's supposed to say it's good? Us. God says, you want to build a world? Practice. Practice finding the light. Finding the good thing. So for you, Joshua, on this Friday night before your Ofruf, and to Sarah, I say to you that this is the deeper meaning behind the seven blessings that we recite under the wedding canopy. Why do we have to have seven? It's enough. Say one. The rabbis say, whatever you bless will increase. 
Whatever you bless and repeat, whatever bright spot you find will become many bright spots. It's a rule of thumb in relationships. It's a rule of thumb in friendship. It's a rule of thumb in, in a world that looks sometimes like it couldn't get much darker. That's our work in the world. Find the bright spot. Trust it. Increase. Let's rise together.